All right. How's everyone today? Great. Good, good, good. Today we're going to cover commercial leasing. We're going to start the day covering commercial leasing, but probably midway to uh, midway, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to teach you guys how to do LOIs. I'm going to start teaching you everyone how to do LOIs. You know, one of the actual most important aspects of uh, commercial real estate, and it's, it's, it's one of the unique aspects of commercial real estate, is the fact that in commercial real estate, we don't really make offers, uh, we don't really make offers right away, okay? We don't, we don't really make offers right away. You know, the reason why is because we don't want 10 or 15 counter offers going back and forth. There's a lot of little details that sometimes in commercial real estate that we have to iron out before we have a deal. So what normally happens in commercial real estate is that we go back and forth with what we call LOIs first, right? Okay, and probably in the next 30 minutes, 40 minutes, we're gonna go over LOIs with you and how easy it is to make one up, okay? And then for the people that are in class, we'll give you an LOI template you know, some of you in this room have actually seen my LOI templates before, right? Yes? Okay, so you guys have worked on it. It's pretty easy. And what an LOI, how an LOI template works is that you start with an LOI template, and if you're making an offer on whether it be a lease or a purchase of a property, you send that LOI to them. And normally what we do is we send them the LOI in a Word document, okay? And then what happens is, and if you don't send it to them in a Word document, what happens is that sometimes their assistants will ask you for it, okay? Because what they do is they redline the Word document and then they send it back to you with their comment. And then what you do is then you blue line it and then you send it back. So then whatever color that they, sometimes they'll blue line it. And so whatever color, that uh, whatever color that you're, that you're using, you consistently use that color, right? And they consistently use their color, and you just go back and forth, and then you get to the point where your deal is, everything is negotiated, and once that happens, then one of you will draft up the entire agreement. Okay, one of you will draft up the entire agreement, okay? Uh, sometimes in commercial, we actually have attorneys drafting up the entire agreement. Does that make sense? We sometimes have attorneys doing it. Normally on a lease, the landlord drafts their agreement. Normally on a lease, the landlord will draft their agreement. On a purchase, normally the person representing buyer will draft up the agreement. Okay? You know, I like the last commercial deal I helped on, even though the buyer, the buyer's agent, even though it's from a big company, they, he was probably sort of on the newer side, so he had us draft up the agreement. Okay? So it doesn't really matter, but, but so I'm going to give you, a, I guess I'm just going to give you an idea of what a, uh, an LOI looks like. Okay? So you sort of have a picture in your mind. You have a, you have a little picture in your mind of what? what LOIs look like, okay? Okay, so, and then in a minute here, I'm gonna be handing you guys these anyways, okay? So I'm gonna be handing, so you don't necessarily need to take pictures of this one, I'll be handing, I'll be handing you guys anyways, okay? All right, so, so this one right here is a commercial LOI. Okay, you'll see in here, this is our official company logo, Berkshire Hathaway Elite Real Estate Commercial Division. This is the logo and the designation that you'll be able to get once you're certified. Does it make sense? Once you're certified, you'll be able to order your separate commercial card. You'll have a commercial designation, all right? You'll have open access to the, all the commercial all the commercial back office from Berkshire Hathaway, okay, and and of course we register you uh, as being certified to do commercial, okay. 
And that's important because, you know, you have to be, you know, insured on your transactions. You do not want to not have, you know, any kind of uh, coverage, okay? Because if you make a mistake, this could be, in commercial, it could be huge mistakes, okay? All right, so uh, this is a sample. This is a sample, okay, of a commercial transaction. This is just a sample, all right? I've, uh, I've gone ahead and redacted and, yeah, so let's pass out the first one first. The one with Steve Park. Okay, there, there you go, that one. Okay. okay. So, what you'll see here is it starts, so you see it? It starts with the company, Berkshire Hathaway Home Services Elite Real Estate Commercial Division. Okay, so you're, you'll be part of our commercial division, okay? Okay, and then the letter basically starts out, you know, to uh, Steve Park, Ed, and, and Bird, and they're from TRI. Okay, it starts out, you know, regarding a purchase offer. So in this case, it'd be a purchase. Okay, in this case, it'll be a purchase. Okay, and uh, basically, this is where we normally put our address. Some of it's pretty straightforward, but once we get to, once we uh, get on, I'll talk to you about it. And then here's the wording. So you get familiar with that, okay? Uh, here, let me get the extras. Okay. So basically, it says this is an LOI letter of intent that outlines the basic terms and conditions that my clients, and you put your name of your client. Okay, now, now here's the reason why in commercial real estate, you always want to identify your client. Sometimes you feel, like, uh, you feel like you don't want to let them know who it is, but actually in the commercial side of things, you know, you want to identify your client because the stronger your client looks in the eyes of the, of the, of the, the seller, the more likely they'll respond to you and the more likely they'll take you seriously. So uh, sometimes when I'm writing this, this letter outlines the basic terms and conditions that my clients, you know, and I might say, you know, uh, you know, ABC, you know, law firm or my clients ABC LLC, you know, are very experienced uh, owner operators they've been in the business they've, they've owned multiple properties like this one and they're very serious about you know uh, starting negotiations for the purchase of the building and you know they're very strong buyers so so this is where you build up your client just a little bit that makes sense mm -hmm. this is where you build up your clients just a little bit okay all right so my clients you know, uh, XYZ Corporation would be willing to pursue sale negotiations for the above property. Now, this is important. This LOI is not binding on either seller or the name of the client. You know, seller or, you know, uh, a XYZ Corporation and will not create any legal rights or liabilities for or against either party, but instead outlines the terms of which, upon which the buyer would be interested in entering a proposed purchase agreement. So basically, we're only in a negotiating term. So if your question to me is, if I send the LOI, are they stuck? The answer is no. That makes sense? If I send in an LOI, are they stuck? No, they're not stuck at all. And that's the reason why we do that. Sometimes in the residential world, we send in an offer, and if they're not serious, and your, their offer gets accepted, unencountered, accepted, you're actually stuck, right? Okay? But in commercial world, we don't really do that, okay? We send in the LOI, and then we start the negotiation process, okay? We send in the LOI, and we start the negotiation process, okay? So, now you're gonna see some lines. So number one, you see property, again. Okay, this is basically, you again, you write the address of the property. Okay, and, and, and I want everyone to understand in commercial, it doesn't really work like residential, and if you do raw land, we normally consider that commercial too. Raw land is considered, for us, our company, 
is considered commercial, okay? And, and when you do raw land or you do commercial, it's not a single family. Single family is considered residential. Raw land, even if it has a farm, you know, it, 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 it's primarily for use for agricultural. Uh, you got to be very careful of what you're offering. There's sometimes, there's a, sometimes there's projects that are selling one unit and you thinking your clients are buying the whole building but they're selling buying only one unit you know sometimes you know you go look at a property and you see two buildings and you think you're buying both but then really you're only buying half you know there's been times where there's been a confusion as to land you know you think you're getting 24 acres but you're only really getting half of that and especially with land there's no address on land so do never, ever, ever sell or buy land and not get the not get the title company to give you the plot map. Okay? And very carefully, and very carefully, you gotta go and look at the plot map versus the what they're buying, and then even have a surveyor, you know, hired for like five hundred thousand dollars and have them even get the lines the property lines drawn okay because i'll tell you land you know e even the city is not perfect okay and sometimes you see fences i remember on a deal where where somewhat okay never trust gps <laughs> i'll tell you that much do not trust gps you put the address of the property and GPS takes you somewhere and you think that's what you're buying. No, never trust GPS, okay? So when you deal with land, land is one of those things where you better make darn sure that you get what you're buying. Because at least the home, you have an address. They've sort of described the home as five bedrooms, four baths. So, you know, I, you know, there's, you know, I haven't seen that many instances where you buy the wrong home. Does that make sense? But literally, I've seen it. But I've seen instances where people bought the wrong piece of land. Okay, you guys get that? So be very careful about that kind of stuff. Okay, be very careful about that kind of stuff. All right, so let's talk about this uh, LOI, okay? And then I'll just go over as many details as I can. All right, so property, make sure you describe the right property. Unit A, unit B, whatever. And so when you property, you might put the address in there and you might put a description of the property in there too. Yes? So if this offer is for a land and then you don't have the address, can you put the parcel number? Yeah, put the parcel number and a description. Okay? Oh. Never, ever, ever. Okay? In commercial, we got to be more careful of what, we, of what we're buying and selling. So an address, to be honest with you, is not good enough in commercial, okay? So you might put an address in there, but you put an address with a description of what it is. So if it's, so because what happens is, is that sometimes you think you're buying a piece of land and you put one parcel number on it. But what if, in actuality, the 32 acres is three parcels? And then you put one parcel number on it. So the confusion is the seller thinks that you offered that price for all three parcels when in, in fact, or, or for only one parcel, when in fact you were actually wanting to buy all 32 acres. One parcel could only be eight acres. So you've made an offer for whatever, $2 million, thinking that you're buying all 32 acres and you only put the, the LOI for one parcel. So, you know, it, 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 while you're doing this, nothing triggers in your brain. To the seller, they only see one APN. So guess what? They write up an offer. And you write up an offer. And you put one parcel number on it. All this time, you just don't think about it. And they're not going to remind you of it because in their mind, they're thinking that's only one parcel. Great. I still got... I still have 24 acres. They're only buying eight acres of it. And then all of a sudden, you know, you go and you, you know, your clients do their studies and you're just not even thinking about it. And then you go to signing 
How many of you actually review a legal description? You don't review it. You don't read it. Even if you read it, you don't understand it. Starting at the southwest east 100th corner on the plot map, you know, then to the, you know, 445 feet northeast of this to this point down here. You don't, it doesn't make sense. So you go all the way to the end, you close escrow. You go all the way to the end and you close the deal. Does that make sense? And guess what? You go all the way to the end, you close the deal. Your clients have planned on what to do with those 32 acres of land. And lo and behold, they just pay $2 million for eight acres. Who do you think is gonna be at fault in all this? Does that make sense? But it's an easy mistake you can make. You understand that? That's a super easy mistake you can make. Okay? So that's why we want to we want to protect you from getting into that circumstance. I mean, I mean, I've seen situations where a GPS takes someone to the front of, of a street because it stops right there. And I, I've seen agent and clients get out, walk the wrong piece of land. Because the main street only takes you to right there. And they walk the wrong piece of land. They go through and buy that piece of land. And later on, that's not the land they bought. They bought the one that was landlocked in the back. Does it make sense? Big, huge problem. Can you tell us real quick what happened? Oh, Susan. Robert? What? Can you tell us real quick what happens in a catastrophe like that? And just straight the lawsuits or what? Well, it's a catastrophe. <laughs> it's a here. It, it, it's 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 a, it's a catastrophe. No, I mean the the remedy of the situation that time was put the property back in the market and resold it, but agent took a huge loss. Okay. Robert, I have seen cases in that particular instance whereby in the LOI. They will, attach, they will attach the legal description of the property that they are buying. You don't necessarily need to go that far. You know, you don't need to go that far. Just describe it. Just describe it. You can, you know, but you don't, I mean, the, the legal description is really long, but but you can. But even if you attach the legal description, do you even know, understand how to read a legal description? You know, and that's the thing. Do you even understand how to read a legal description? Are you taking your measuring stick out and measuring what 400 feet looks like? You know what I'm saying? It's, it's hard to picture. So that's why I always recommend in your due diligence. And just so you know, you know, if we have time, then, then I'll go over. Oh, get my commercial binder too, if you can. Okay. Uh, if we have time today, I'll go over the due diligence checklist as well with you today if I have time. Okay. So anyways, let's move forward. But, but the part in property, make sure it's properly described. Okay. That's all that matters. It's just, for a property, don't just put an address. Put a description of what it is that, that, that you're trying to purchase here, okay? Full description, okay? So it's like, for example, if your client's trying to buy a office complex, then put in here office complex, eight freestanding buildings, approximately, you know, 40,000 square feet, so-and-so. Does that make sense? So you would describe it there, what you're actually trying to buy. Because then, you know, you're on the same page, okay? Okay, purchase price is what you're trying to buy. Okay, where it says terms, uh, we just put cash to seller at close of escrow. That just means that at close of escrow, the seller is going to get paid. That doesn't mean your clients are paying cash. All it means is that at the end of the deal, the client's gonna get paid. We're not expecting the seller to carry. Okay? We're just not accept, expecting the clients to carry. If we're expecting the clients to carry, then you would put it there. So that's 50% of cash uh, to seller at close of escrow, seller to carry the remaining 50% over, uh, over five years amortized, you know, over five years interest only at 8% interest rate, whatever it is. Yes? Okay, so let's see if you, if you make a loan, right? You simply cash at, at the close of escrow? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because down here you'll see, you know, we'll have uh, down here we'll see we'll, we'll 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 say it down here. Okay. Okay. Down here you'll see it. Okay. So, but you could also put it here. Cash or seller close the escrow, and then right underneath it, if you want, you can do it that way too. That's fine. You can do it that way too. Is you put in there the client is getting, you know, client will be getting, you know, financing through, you know, local bank. Does that make sense? Okay, and you can put that in. All right, interest. These are commercial terms. Interest is fee simple interest in land and all improvements. Fixtures located at the property, all related, related licenses and goodwill. Okay, in this case, what was being purchased was uh, a commercial property that had an ongoing business. Some businesses don't have any kind of licenses and goodwill. Okay? But in this case, you know, this business had licensing and goodwill. I believe there was some type of uh, gas station or convenience store. Okay, if that's the case, then then you're also asking for any kind of related licenses and goodwill. Okay? So in this case, it's fee simple interest of land, all improvements, fixtures, located at property, and all related licenses and goodwill. Okay? So that's, that's basically where we put there. Okay? All right, next one just talks about the next term talks about deposits. Okay, in commercial real estate, you know, normally, you know, we've got to put some type of deposit that's substantial enough for them to know that we're serious. Okay, but not so much so that your clients, you know, lock in a lot of their money in escrow. Okay, you know, normally 1% is pretty common. Okay, normally 1% is pretty common for, uh, for a deposit. So, you know, for a million dollar transaction, we're normally looking at a $10,000, uh, you know, a $10,000 deposit. Okay, some will ask for more. Sometimes they'll counter back and say deposit to be. That's fine if it's up, to, it's up to your client. All right, but normally 1%. So if it's like a, if it's like a $5 million purchase, you put a $50,000 deposit in there. Okay, right. Uh, in this case, deposit is within five business days from execution of purchase agreement. Okay, once the purchase agreement's uh, uh, agreed between buyer and seller, then title is opened and we have the deposit wired there uh, or sent there, you know, in a legal way uh, within five days. Okay, five business days. Deposit shall be fully refundable to buyer through the contingency period. As for company to be determined, okay? So, deposit shall be fully refundable through the contingency period. So, so this is important, okay? Is what one of the things that's important in commercial is commercial is not like residential where you have to remove your contingencies. The contingencies just basically most of the time are just removed, depending on who drafts the who drafts it. You guys understand? So, so, you know, when we draft it on behalf of buyer, we will put in there that we have to remove the contingencies. But if the contract's drafted by their company, uh, if it's drafted on air forms, or if it's drafted by uh, their attorneys, a lot of times you have to be very careful is because contingencies normally, they're removed on that day. Okay, so if they're removed at 60 days, at 60 days, boom, they're gone. You guys understand that? Okay. No, no, no. Uh, I will talk about what typical is because different types of commercial is different types of typical. Okay. All right. Um, but, but just be really careful with your time periods. Okay. Be very careful with your time periods. All right. The reason being is, you know, if you, if it's sometimes, for example, you have to be very careful. Sometimes in commercial deals, they're going to pass through the deposit to seller after the contingency periods have, have gone. 
So sometimes they'll ask that the deposit be passed through. You know what that means? It means that if the deposit is 100 grand, on that 60th day, the title company released that deposit to the seller. And getting that deposit back at that moment in time is very, very difficult. It'll take lawsuit. Does that make sense? And lawsuit call cost your client 60, 100,000 even to try to get it back. It's not even worth it. You just lose it. You get it? Okay? So in commercial, you got to really understand all the details of that. All right? So let's talk about the contingency periods. Okay, if it's an existing business, if it's an existing business, we have normally two major contingencies. I think in this case, we were actually paying cash. Okay? All right? All right? Well, it actually had financing period in there. Okay, but there's two major contingency periods. The first one is the inspection period, the other one is the financing period. Okay? So, like residential, we try always try to put two contingencies in there. One is for our due diligence, inspection and due diligence. That's one, okay? So I'll read that. Buyer's inspection period. Buyer shall have 60 days to inspect the property and pertinent information inspections following the execution of the purchase sale agreement and prove the property and complete any and all due diligence, including but not limited to inspections and preliminaries. Okay? Now, if you've ever been in a commercial transaction before, there's really no such thing as a TDS. There's not an SPQ, which is seller property questionnaire. There's not a residential TDS in there. Okay? As an agent, you will request any and all pertinent information. Okay? It's called a due diligence package. So you're going to ask the other company... Can you provide me your due diligence package? Do you have any? In it? And then they might come back and say, we don't have anything. Or they said, this is all we have. Okay? All right? So you'll request for a due diligence package. Now, depending on the businesses, there's things you can request. Okay? You know, if it's a, if it's a business, then you request, you know, the, the financials. Profit and loss, copy of licenses, okay, if it comes with a business. If it's a property with tenants, you request all the rental agreements, okay, and the P&Ls to show, you know, payment history of, of, of the income that you've been receiving. Does that make sense? Okay, so those are the things that you request. All right, those are the things you request. All right. So if 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 it's, if it's that type of if it's that type of uh, uh, business, then you request that type of things. Okay. All right. And then we'll go through due diligence as well. On the flip side, from the buyer side, you know we will have our inspections for due diligence. Okay. You know normally, you know if you have a loan on the building, they'll always ask for a phase one environmental. You know, you'd if, you, if there's an existing building on it, you'd probably do a, uh, a, a commercial building inspection, okay? So you test the environment, you test the building for a building inspection, all right? You know, if there's AC units, if it's if quite a few AC units, you know, the building inspection sometimes may refer you to a HVAC specialist, you know, so, so just like a home, okay? But, but the building is just a little bit more moving pieces, all right? So you'll be inspecting financials, you'll be inspecting the environment, you'll be inspecting the building, all right? You'll be inspecting income, you know, all that kind of stuff, all right? So normally, you know, on a pretty straightforward purchase, pretty straightforward type of business, 60 days is enough. If it's a gas station, you might even ask for a little bit longer than 60 days because you might have to do not only a phase one, but phase two environmental, okay? A phase one environmental normally costs anywhere from $2,500 to $5,000. Buyer will have to pay, okay? So you'll ask if there was a recent environmental study done 
But if it wasn't done within the last year or two, then you might have another one done. Is it 2500 to 5000 Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, when you're buying something that has, you know, if there was some kind of contaminant that was found, then you might have to go phase two. Phase two could be fifteen to fifty thousand dollars. Okay, phase two can be fifteen to fifty thousand dollars. Okay. All right. Yes. If there was a, a already an environmental um, done on the building, the building has been sitting. Do they still have to do another? Yeah, I mean, if, if the environmental is a year or more, a year or two more, then yeah, I would do it. Okay. All right, you can you can't take a ten year old environmental study and think that's what's happening now, okay? Because it could be a gas station and it could have had recent leaks in the in the in, in, in the gas tanks in the past year. You know, the only way you find it out is if they do a study on the soil right now and see if there's any contaminants. You know what I'm saying? You know, so you can't take a ten year. Well, the bank, if you're getting a loan, the bank's not going to take it. You know, if you're buying it cash. You know, see, that, that's the thing is sometimes you'll run into clients that have cash. And so, and, and maybe your clients aren't particularly picky. They'll say, I want to save the three, $4,000 and I don't want to do environmental. I don't recommend that. Because you never know. If you run into an environmental issue, this is what happens. If you run into an environmental issue and the issue happens be causing contaminations in the underground water and the water runs into runs you know into the the, the properties beneath you not only do you have to clean up the contaminants on your land but you might have to clean up the contaminants on on a mile of land all the way down to the city sewer system imagine cleaning up the next 40 properties you see what I'm saying See, the problem is, is the contaminants moving. If you're, if you, this guy, this, this guy is the uh, gas station. They have this huge oil leak, this gas leak. They don't know. It's not like they dig out and they take binoculars and they can see underneath. So over the course, let's say there's a rupture and ruptures happen. How ruptures happen? Easy. The earth moves underneath us. Does it make sense? Especially in the Bay Area where it's an earthquake zone. The earth moves underneath us and as it moves, sometimes it might crack the crack the, the, the gas tanks underneath the land. You know what all cracks gas tanks? Trees. Vines crack gas tanks. Okay? And so 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 you have all these types of things that could cause cracks in the gas tank. And, and so, let's say it caused a crack, and no one knew about it for the last 10 years, and then you run environmental, and you found out that, you know, that the, the, the gas has been leaking for 10 years, and they never really knew it. And then, and then the gas gets into the water supply, because there's water underneath us, right? That's why we got well water. And, the, and the, so all the gas contaminates the water underneath us. And because, it's, and because the water moves, it's moving, and then, you know, water, let's say it moves, like, you know, this way, west. Not only do you have to treat your property, but you have to treat every property. And when they find out, you have to treat it right away. So if you don't learn about that stuff, so let's say you, get, you think you've got to give yourself a good deal on this gas station. You bought it for $5 million. And you didn't do the environmental study. And then two years after you own it, or a year after you own it, your neighbor sells his property. And the neighbor ran a, a, an environmental study, and they found contamination. And the neighbor goes, how do we have gasoline contamination on our land? We're not a gas station. We're just an office building or a retail building. So they say, wait, the nearest gas station is, you know, a block this way. So they call environmental department. The environmental department says, hey, we're reading contamination of gas. 
in your water system and now it's contaminating your soil. We're afraid it's coming from, you know, the, the gas station a, a block down the street. So they go and they do their own study. They have the right to do that, right? They go, they do their study. Yeah, this is where it's coming from. Guess what? Now the gas station's owner will have to clean up the whole entire mile of offices. You have to go there and, and, and let's say it's $15 million to do that cleaning. And you're the owner, you're the new owner of the property, now you have to clean it. Does that make sense? All because you decided your clients paid cash. You said, oh, you could pay $5,000 for this environmental. You said, I don't want to pay it. Do I need it? And they say, well, they have a 10-year-old environmental. It sits very clean. <laughs> oh, okay, forget about it. I don't want to pay for this. Boom, now they have $15 million. Because the seller, you go back to the seller, hey, this has happened since you own the property, but yay. When you bought it, you had the right to do your due diligence. You bought it as is. When you buy something, you assume all the responsibilities on your property. So as an agent, let's say we recommend the phase one or phase two. There is no insurance for that. What? There is no insurance or anything. What insurance do they have? No, even like this gas station is well empty. No, they have insurance for for all types of things. For an explosion, they have insurance for all types of things. But for contamination, no insurance carrier is going to cover that. How are they going to carry that? So what's the responsibility of the agent? Do we do waivers or do is it just... Uh, no, I mean, and, you know, we recommend they do a, what you call it. Then if they, so they re adamantly don't want to do it, then we have to do waivers, all types of waivers. Okay? we got to do it in writing. You know, that's the problem with agents, I think, sometimes is that you think it's okay to tell them with your mouth. 100% of the time, what you tell them with your mouth cannot be proven. You guys understand that? We work in a world that you need to be in writing. I told, I, I don't know if I mentioned to you guys, but, but we just had the same case where we had to go down to mediation at the, at the board. And I had to attend on behalf of the agent as well. The agent told the client that the home addition in the back was permitted as a, as a overhang, but it was not permitted to be an enclosed room. The permit was only for the patio cover. It was not permitted to be a room. They told the client and the, the buyer and the buyer's agent on, on multiple occasions. The agent at the hearing even said, yes, that agent told me. Yes, that agent told me that, that, that it, it, it wasn't permitted. Buyer the whole entire time said, no, I don't remember anything. It's not in writing, it don't count. Buyer contradicted his own agent. But neither agents put it in writing. Okay? That buyer got $50,000. Both agents split the tab. 200,000 transaction. Commission was like four grand. Agent ended up paying $25,000. Okay, does it make sense? Simply because agent just didn't put in writing. All you have to do, somewhere, SPQ, TDS, email, worst text message, on napkin. I don't know. You know. I, <laughs> nowhere did either agent. Oh, on top of that, both agents got fined two thousand dollars from the board, and they got written up. Okay, there you have it. So you guys learn now that everything has to be in writing, and if it's, so, if it's of importance, it has to be in writing on more than one occasion. And it can't be on MLS. A lot of people think that whatever you put a confidential or public remarks on MLS is incorporated into the contract, but it's not. You know what I'm saying? You can disclose it all you want on MLS, 
it does not mean that you've disclosed it in a, in a contract. Okay? Because on the flip side, I've seen people offer. Okay? I've seen people offer on the flip side. You, uh, uh, I've seen people offer you know, spas, jacuzzis, bonuses to agents to help sell a property. You write up the offer, you leave that thing out of your offer, and later on, they take their spa with them, they take their swing set with them, client goes in, spa's not there, swing set's not there, both replacement costs for that $15,000. Now agents saying, oh my God, what happened to it? Guess what happened to it? You made the mistake, you're gonna have to pay for it. You guys understand that? I mean, I have seen people say, beautiful ja jacuzzi and spa with with spa room, you know, with the property that they're describing, these wonderful amenities on the marketing report of your MLS, right? But Or, you know, brand new Sub-Zero refrigerator, you know, with brand new Samsung, you know, uh, uh, washer and dryer to be included with property. Man, so you're walking through your clients going, yeah, look, look at this beautiful fridge. Paid $8,000 for this beautiful fridge. And oh, look, this washer and dryer set, or I just looked at Lowe's, it cost $2,000 for both of these. But man, you get that. That's why you offer full price. Oh, okay, great, I'll offer full price. Boom. At signing, they're so happy. You close, you give them a key, those things are gone. Wait, 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 is this a mistake? It wasn't a fridge. Where's washer and dryer? Uh, you call the agent and say, hey, seller took the fridge, washer and dryer. You guys said, fridge stays, washer and dryer stays. Agent goes, well, look at your offer. You didn't put it in there. Look at your offer. You didn't put it in there. Yeah. Okay, so when they put that on MRS, both are those the same. When a grow, even though we didn't put it on the contract, we can't sue them because we no, can't. No, it's not. You know why? It says right on the bottom of the MLS disclosure, whatever is offered on MLS doesn't necessarily mean that's offered on your purchase agreement. Whatever is on your purchase agreement, you ask for it. You have to ask for it. You have to. Okay. You know why? Because sometimes you say, you know, I don't need that refrigerator or washer and dryer. I'm just going to offer $15,000 less. You guys take it with you. Right? Take it with you. On high end listings, a lot of times people offer their whole house of furniture. Home furnished. For a $3 million home sold. With furniture. You forget to mention that the furniture is included. Matter of fact, if it's sold with furniture, you ask for an inventory list of everything that's staying. You ask for an inventory list of everything that's staying. Because what they mean by furniture may not might not mean that the personal item. Does that make sense? It doesn't mean that everything stay it doesn't mean that all their Chanel purses that are they're in there stay with it you know what I'm saying okay not consider furniture yeah okay so on all the commercial the focus houses only you know such thing that we are uh, really in but on the commercial we have uh, gas station we have restaurant we have building we have um, uh, apartment unit so do we have the list of what we're asking for on each of the contract but this is a general contract for everything. Which one? I mean, this is really, uh, no, this is just LOI. I, I know, but still, you know, all just... Um, what, what I mean is, like, you know, when you, you offer for apartment, right? So you have to ask for everything that you need to ask for the, uh, you know, um, yeah, yeah, all the items and all that. But sometimes it's not in here. No, you, you can't put it in here because if you'd be doing too much homework just to put an LOI. Too much work, okay? You get the list when you're in contract. When you're in contract, then you ask for all that list. Okay, what's included? You want to do it now? 
you want to do a week's worth of work so that you could get your offer denied? You know, it's like not worth it. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If it's a business, guys, if it's a business, you know, there's a lot of things in a business that you'll ask for their financials. When you get the financials, you'll see them. You'll see the payments they make. When you see a lease payment for this and this and this, then you'll know. You know what I'm saying? Because if they don't disclose something later on, you have you have something to go back at the seller. So they got to disclose to you. Say, you know, send us all of your leases. Send us all of your profit and loss that shows us what operating expenses you have in the property. You know, so once we go into the math portion of this class, you'll you'll understand how do you collect the list of all the all the expenses on a property or, or a business, you know what I'm saying? And then you'll see all the types of expenses they have. Yes. Robert, if it's physically attached, is it different commercial than residential? I mean if it's physically attached in a in system Yeah, it's different. Yeah, yeah, it's different. I mean, okay, sometimes you buy the warehouse. It don't mean you buy all the printing machines that are part of the warehouse, do you? Let's say you're buying a warehouse from a commercial printer, and they, they have all these Heidelberg uh, copiers there. These things cost a $200,000 copy machines, you know, mass-producing, you know, copy machines. You think they're going to leave those because they're attached to the ground? No, it's business equipment. Business equipment is not, is not treated the same way in... in it's not treated like a a a, a, a stove, okay? <laughs> you know, in residential, you know, the things that if you're buying the building, you're buying the building. Anything related to a business, if the person selling you the building is a let's say because it happens all the time. Yeah, but you still got to list it, okay? You know, fixtures. What they mean are bathroom fixtures, light fixtures, okay? But business fixtures. Not necessarily. Like for example, you might buy a building and it has an existing restaurant, but the existing restaurant is moving. So the restaurant itself are going to be bringing their 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 equipment, you know, their stoves and stuff. They might bring take it all out. You know what I'm saying? So you got to label it all. So in commercial real estate, don't think that the word fixture is anything attached. If it's if it happens to be for that business, that business you know is moving, they're going to take those things with them. Okay? Imagine you buy a warehouse, you know, you buy a warehouse, and the warehouse is currently a big printing company. You think they're going to leave all their print presses for you? Those four color copiers cost them $200,000 machines each. They're going to leave a million dollars worth of copy machines there because they're attached to the ground? Right? No, they're not. Okay? What's that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, guys. So, so, so that's where it says contingency. That's where you do your inspections. Okay. Next one is financing period. A normal commercial loan, the financing is around 90 days. Okay. 60 to 90 days. Government's cost a little bit will take a little bit longer if it's a government SBA 7A 504 uh, 7A loan or 504 loan then then it'll be it'll be a little longer okay there's going to be a class probably one of my last classes is commercial financing and in that class you're going to learn about normal financing conduit financing bridge financing short term financing. Uh, permanent financing so we're gonna just talk about that so you have an understanding because if you're gonna help your client buy a building you gotta have you gotta have a look, grasp of financing okay and then we're gonna teach you difference between SBA 7a loan versus a 504 loan okay you know uh, what's the advantages and disadvantages of either one okay like you know believe it or not SBA has two types of loans one's more for a paper one's more B paper you know, one's, you know, a little bit more strict, okay? One's a little bit less strict, okay? The one that's a little bit more strict have higher loan amount. The one that's a little bit less strict uh, has typically a little bit lower loan amount. So we're going to go through all those details, okay? So you're going to learn a lot about these, this kind of stuff, all right? But so I'll, I'll get to that at that time. 
but financing period, in this case, we put 90 days. Now, this is from a real LOI. It went, it, when you know how to do an LOI like this, okay, when you, when you do a normal LOI like this, it makes the other company feel more comfortable about how you do business. You have some rogue agents. Man, the first thing they do is they send over an offer. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and if you're working with a experienced commercial brokerage, you know, the first thing that tells them is, yeah, this person's sort of inexperienced. Because when you send them an offer, there's all these points on here that, that we're going to have to counter. And we don't want to go counter back and forth. We don't want 14 counters. You understand that? So they might just call you and say, hey, well, just send us over an LOI. You know, that's fine, but just send us over an LOI. You know, let's work out all the details first and then we'll go get a clean offer together. Make sense? Then we'll get our, our clean offer together, okay? All right, so uh, closing costs. You know, we have what we call area customary closing costs, okay? Sort of interesting for commercial. But this is what all commercial people normally do is you'll see the phrase customary cl closing fees. So what you do is you call the title company you use and you say, send me what the customary fees are for this area. Because this area, the customary might be 50-50 on escrow and seller pays these fees, buyer pays these fees. That's customary. If you work with an experienced shop, and you start designating seller to pay for all this stuff, they might say, these aren't customary fees. So they might counter you back as customary fees. So easily, what you do is you just call the title company that does commercial in the area and say, what are the customary fees? Who's paying what here? Okay? Because the customary fees here is different than the ones in, in the Bay Area. And they're definitely different for SoCal. Okay, definitely different for SoCal. Okay. Customary fees set with the Sacramento here. Yeah, so just ask, hey, what are Sacramento customary fees? Who pays what? And they'll send you. And they, a lot of times the title company even have the areas. They even have the areas, Sacramento County, San Joaquin County. And they, they have who pays what in the areas. That's customary. And they'll even have a spreadsheet of customary fees. So it's a set. It's not negotiable. No, no, it's negotiable. You can put customary fees where you say, hey, I want the seller to pay for this, this, and this. Okay. But, but normally they just have customary fees, okay? See, so that's where you see here, purchase and sale. Purchase and sale agreement shall be prepared two days after acceptance of terms. Okay, it doesn't matter who prepares it. Normally, I like to prepare it. Okay, normally I like to prepare it. Okay? It's not an yeah, I mean, I, I like to make sure I know what's on there. I don't want them to slip anything in there, you know, that I don't know about. You know what I'm saying? So normally, I like to prepare, okay? I normally like to prepare it. Um, uh, next week, we're going to go through the contracts. Um, for all of you in here, because you are a member of the board, too, we're going to use the car forms for you, okay? All right? People that don't have access to the... But... They might counter back with you have to use the air forms. Okay? So, just so you know, since we're realtors too, we have access to the car form because technically car forms are supposed to be used by realtors. That's why it says California Associates of Realtors on the top. Right? All the wording you see, okay, that has anything to do with realtors have the word realtors in it. Does it make sense? Okay. So, as realtors, you could use the car forms. In reality, I'm seeing more and more companies using car forms. Okay? On the deal I helped one of our agents close six, seven, eight months ago, uh, we requested car forms from everyone, and everyone obliged by sending us offers in their car form. Make sense? All right, so everyone sent us car forms because I asked for it. Okay. Yeah, no, sometimes they'll have their own attorney companies. You'll see that a lot on leases where they have their management company and they have their own form. That's fine. That means that you have some homework to do. You have to sit there and read every word, okay? All right? 
you have to read in, in commercial real estate. What's your take on air forms versus the car forms? I like them. Like no, I like both. What's the difference between the two? Air forms are more complicated. Air form lean more towards seller than it do buyer. Car form lean more towards buyer than it does seller. Okay, I I, I think uh, air forms are more strict. Okay, you know I think uh, like like for example in car forms contingencies have to be removed, whereas in air forms contingencies are passively removed most of the time. That makes sense. So so there's less margin of error in an air form on on the buyer. Both. Huh? No, leasing, they use, their own, they use their own form. And then uh, air form leasing is strict, you know. Uh, uh, but I think all the forms are pretty strict when it comes to leasing. Okay? Yeah. Also, a seller might ask a buyer to buy temporary insurance to close their insurance to walk the property with the inspection. Sometimes. 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 Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so that's uh, that's purchase sale agreement. Okay. Close of escrow. Buyer to close escrow. 105 days from mutual uh, execution. That's because normally you close escrow 15 days after loan contingency is removed. So what's pretty standard in commercial real estate is you close 15 days after all contingencies are removed. Okay, that's pretty normal. All right, that's pretty normal. Okay, uh, finally, broker, Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, represents the buyer in this transaction, shall be paid 3% for selling broker's commission arising out of this transaction. That's where we uh, make sure they know that we're expecting a commission, okay? Normally though, when you write the LOI, you call the agent, and you ask them, what is the co-op? Okay, you ask them, what is the co-op? You know, what are you paying the cooperating broker? Okay, and they will tell you 3%, or they'll tell you we're paying two, or two and a half. So they actually tell you what they're paying on the cooperative, okay? All right, and it's up to you to want to make that offer. Sometimes you might even call ahead of time before you tell the client about the property. The reason why is some will not co-op at all. You know, just so you know, there's some gas station operators that have, that, that, that represent a group of gas station owners. They don't cooperate. You have to send them your client and they will pay you a referral fee, flat fee, 10 grand, whatever it is. If you choose to work with them, then that's what you're gonna make. Okay, so you got that? So you don't know, you don't do your homework, you send in an LOI with their client name and information on it, they might just go straight out, call your client, say, hey, you can buy it, but we're not co-oping at all. Does that make sense? Okay, so you gotta ask, you know, or is there a co-op, are you co-oping with agents? Yeah, we are. What are you guys paying? Oh, we're only paying 2%. Oh, we're paying 3%. Does that make sense? So you gotta ask, okay? You gotta ask. It's not listed anywhere. It's gotta ask. Sometimes on CoStar it will it will list it, but sometimes they don't list it. You gotta call and ask, okay? In this business, believe it or not, in commercial, you gotta be able to communicate. Okay, you gotta be able to communicate. That's when being part of Berkshire Hathaway actually makes a lot of sense. Because you know why? Because you come from a no-name company, they never heard of your brand before. I'm I'm, I'm Tim with uh, ABC, never heard of me, real estate company. Uh, oh, yeah, we're not cooperating with you guys. If you want, you can send the client over. Oh, we're with Berkshire Hathaway Commercials Division, Commercial Division. You know, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they'll deal with you, you know what I'm saying? Right? And that's the truth. Okay, that's the truth, all right? Okay. All right, expiration of proposal. You normally give them like a week to respond. This proposal shall expire 5 p.m. May 30th, 2019. You know, whatever it is, you know, when we wrote it up, 
uh, you know, uh, we normally give them um, five days to respond, five days or a week to respond. And again, we reiterate it. Notwithstanding that either or both parties may expend substantial efforts and sums in anticipation of entering into a purchase and sale agreement, the parties acknowledge that in no event will this letter be construed as an enforceable contract to purchase the property. Okay, so this again says that in no way is this a purchase contra, uh, a contract to purchase the property and each party accepts the risk that no such purchase will be executed. Each party will be free to terminate negotiations with the, with the other for any reason whatsoever at any time prior to the execution of the purchase and sale agreement without incurring liability to the other. Okay, we look forward to working with you. The reason why that's important is this. Let's say, for example, you have a client that was really serious. So your client's really serious. And there's a piece of property they offered $5 million on. Whereas there's another person interested, but they only offered one to offer $4 million on. And so because we're in negotiations, <coughs> You know, because we're in negotiations, we're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and we're taking our time a little bit, and then all of a sudden, your client decides to change their mind. They want to go a different direction. At the same time, the $4 million buyer for this one, because they were negotiating with us, they found a different property and bought something else. We backed out, they backed out, now seller had no one to sell. And seller want to come back and say, you know, I'm going to sue you guys. You guys held off, held us off for like a month and a half on negotiating back and forth all the terms. You guys, you guys told us you're very serious, so we 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 ignored the other offer or we put them to the side, and now you guys are gone. We lost both offers. You know, you guys owe us hundred thousand dollars because you you made us lose the offer. So wait, look at your LOI. It says specifically that that we have no deal until the deal is in writing. Does that make sense? We have no deal until the deal is in writing. And yeah, we like your property, but upon further investigation going back and forth, during that time we found another property we like better. So we're just gonna move on to a different property. Sorry. You know? Does that make sense? So that's the reason for that language, right? You guys understand? Okay, that's the reason for that language, okay. All right, and that's it. It's from, uh, normally, when you do an LOI, you do it with both, normally you would do it with both me and you on it. Does that make sense? Okay. Because, because especially for insurance purposes, uh, we want to make sure that, you know, we, they know that, you know, there's someone who's qualified, you know, working with you on this stuff. Does that make sense? When you're new, you don't want to do anything on your own, okay? When you're new, you don't want to do anything on your own, okay? Because, because your level of experience is not, just not there yet. You know, once you get to the point where you have, you know, 10, 15 of these deals under your belt, then yeah, do it on your own, okay? But until then, let's just work here as a team, all right? Probably in the last week of the class, the training, we're probably gonna have an interest list of getting groups of you into certain specialties first. You know, I mean, it doesn't mean you can't change from office to, you know, uh, to retail or whatever. You can do everything. But, but there'll be a time where we'll break you into groups of people that want to do retail. And as a retail group, start going out there trying to get, you know, listings on retail properties. That makes sense? And study the retail for an area, right? Because just so you know, that's what retail groups do. A retail group and commercial will meet every week for an hour and talk about you know, the new de retail developments coming up, talk about the type of tenants that should go into those types of developments, talk about what's available in these retail centers, and go after the type of retail listings. And when you go after the listings, you might get it as a group. You understand? I mean, if you're going to look to make three, four, you know, Five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars on one transaction, you know, it's okay to split it between three people. Does that make sense? Right? Because as a single individual, you might not win the deal. 
as a single individual, they might not give you the deal, right? You know, here you are walking there and there by yourself, a little bit green, and you're competing against Chris Campbell and his retail group, you're going to lose. You understand? You compete with Janelli, Janelli and his retail group, he's going to lose. It's as easy as that. What gives you the advantage is that you are with Berkshire Hathaway, right? At least you have that. At least you have the world's biggest name under your belt. At least you have that first. That's important. You know, you don't feel so bad. You know what I'm saying? Okay? But then, but then you got to be able to open your mouth. And if you open your mouth as a group, then you should be okay. If it's a big deal, I'll come with you. And then you should be more than okay. Okay? All right? Okay, put the, put the, put the other one on. And let's pass that out. Robert, all these inspections, um, I know, does it normally only take 60 days or less to do these building and environmental studies and all that? No, um, just so you know, if it's gas station, it's going to take longer. If it's gas station, you're probably, you're probably looking at around 90 days of inspection, due diligence, or even even 120 days. Oh, okay? On the uh, if, it's, if it's land, then you need it more land, maybe even 120 days. Okay. Yeah. Kind of a crazy question, but on the phase two, it's so expensive. Someone goes and they find out you got environmental hazards or whatever, and you say the buyer that he spends that money. Is there any recourse? Is it money's no. just gone? And money's gone. That's it. Just move on. Just move on. Okay. I mean, you could ask the seller to give you one. If they agree, you know. Are, yeah. these, are these commercial inspectors and, and people who do space studies, are they readily available? Is it hard to find them? Or? Oh, no. Environmental, there's plenty of environmental company, engineering companies that can do the studies. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just so you know, like for example, you know, uh, there's a transaction I did last year or, or early part of this year that was a, a old historical, uh, very old historical building that used to be a laundromat, and they did find contamination. The 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 phase two and all the engineering was darn near close to eighty thousand dollars. Yeah. You know the the. You know, the treatment was estimated to be a half million dollars to treat it and build all the vapor barriers. They call them vapor barriers underneath. You know how you build vapor barriers? You build, you know, you 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 have to drill the, you have to drill like all these different areas of the foundation, and you have to put you put pipes and and put and put uh, big air vents, build air vents underneath. And the air vents are meant to suck up all the air that comes up from the from the ground, suck it up and channel it out so that the the, the bad air doesn't get into the building. Make sense? People don't realize that contamination seeps into the air that comes up from the ground. And if it seeps into a building and you have employees sitting there working all day. It could cause them to get sick. You understand that? See, people don't realize that. Contamination is not just contamination, contaminating water. See, like as we're talking, you know, were some of you surprised to hear that if contaminants contaminate the water and the water runs down, you know, to wherever it runs down, you got to treat your land and all the land downstream from it. Does that make sense? If it's contamination that's going into the air, oh, there's some people. If it's contamination that's going into the air, okay, if it's contamination that's going into the air, what happens is, is the air goes up and it, and it hits the air that we breathe. Okay? And that, and that will hurt you. So contamination has a lot of different phases to it. You guys understand that? Contamination has a lot of phases. It can, it can affect the ground. It can affect the air quality. Okay? Yeah, it's bad. You, know, you don't want to deal with contamination. Okay? You don't want to deal with it. All right? Okay. Next one is leasing. Let's see how we are on time. 
Okay. All right. Okay. So this next one is the least. Okay. So this one is very similar to the other one. Berkshire Hathaway Commercial Division. Our information. Okay. This one is to Josh Schmidt in Capital Mall for a restaurant. For a restaurant. Okay. All right. So let's let's go over my letter, dear Josh. And Josh is a big time uh, is a big time uh, commercial guy downtown. Okay. Uh, Josh deals with a lot of uh, government owned property downtown. Okay. Says here, dear Josh, this letter of intent outlines the terms that blank will be willing to pursue further negotiations for the above reference premises. This LOI is non-binding either to the landlord or my client, and will not create any legal rights or liabilities for or against either party, but instead outlines the terms of which the tenant would be interested in entering a proposed lease. Okay. In this case, see now this gives you an example of me. You know, giving a little bit of insight on the client it says, you know, blank client are very experienced with over 15 years each of experience working in and owning this type of operation. We are verified that this group has more than a million dollars in the bank and substantial assets that will provide in the PFS prior to the lease signing. PFS stands for what? Personal financial statement. PFS is a personal financial statement. Okay. The personal financial statement will include things like a menu, okay, an operating plan, okay. Menu says we are going to be serving these types of foods. Now, let me ask everyone something. Why is, in a lease, why is a menu important? Yes. Let's say you are a, a little pokeball yeah. type deal, right? Let's say you're a pokeball. You know that new pokeball, right? You're a pokeball type. I think this was even a pokeball. And you're a pokeball type restaurant. But, of course, in your pokey type restaurant, you intend to serve a bunch of boba drinks. That, that's big these days. You guys know what I'm talking about? The boba drinks. But what if in the little center they already have a boba exclusive? Which happens. So you provide the menu to them with what you're going to serve. So they could see if there's overlapping things they're exclusives for. And they will let you know that, hey, we're okay having you have a pokey, but you can't serve boba drinks. Because we already have a boba franchise here with a boba exclusive. You guys understand that? You don't know that. Well, maybe you do know that because, you know, you were there. If you're, you know, I mean, your clients would have to see the place. You would have to drive the place and see, okay, what other restaurants are here. Make sense? You know, are we overlapping here, right? I mean, you can't be, like, let's say you're a, you're a breakfast place, but you want to serve, you know, Subway sandwiches. But there's a subway in there, or Togo's in there. They 100% have, a, have, a, have an exclusive on subway type sandwiches. Does that make sense? You guys understand what I'm saying? Okay, so normally on some kind of restaurant, at least they'll ask you for a menu. They'll ask you for hours of operation. This is why. If the normal standard operating hours for the whole entire place is 10 to nine, you can't be one of those places that closes at 3 o'clock every day. You understand that? Because just so you know, there's breakfast diners that close at 3 every day. They don't serve anything but breakfast and lunch. You know, there's places that are dinner-only places too. Right? If it's, a, if it's a center that wants to be open, continuous operation, they don't want one tenant that's closed half the day. 
So they'll ask you for your menu. They'll ask you for hours of operation. You understand that? Don't be surprised. Because that's what they want to know. And of course, they're going to ask you, have you run this type of business before? Okay? Show me that you've run this type of business before. If it's an A, uh, if it's a class A center, they don't want people going in and out and not paying rent. It makes sense? Yeah. Benny. What, what, what was the uh, PFF thing for you? Personal financial statement. Oh, okay. Personal financial statement, okay? So see, it says here, we have verified this group that the group has more than a million dollars in the bank and substantial assets that we will provide in a personal financial statement prior to the lease, okay? I will also send you a proposed sample menu and business plan at that time. We'd like to get a better idea of the terms of your client would be comfortable with first. I believe that they will form an LLC to operate the business. They will sign personal guarantees for the lease, okay? So normally when clients sign a lease, they businesses sign a lease, but the businesses are normally new. So in this case, they will have to find personal sign personal guarantees. Is the personal guarantee includes like the spouse's income too? I mean No, it includes them. It includes them. But it, it, it will but spouse and them share income and assets. So yeah, it includes the spouse too. They might even ask the spouse to sign a, a personal guarantee, okay? All right. Yeah. And they might have the lease, their lease expired in a few years, or, so they, they should ask for an option. Oh, yeah. No, well, you'll see in there, okay? So, premises. So, I'm going to go through all this. Okay, premises. Okay, approximately 1,798 square feet of retail space located at. So, then that's our description. Located at, okay, you know, all right? Okay, that's the description. Landlord, you know, can you put the landlord, who, who the landlord is, all right, you know, so-and-so LLC, management group, you know, city of Sacramento, whatever, okay. Tenant, in this case, LLC to be determined with personal guarantee from so-and-so. Or the tenants, you know, current a a active business, they're moving, okay, so you describe the name of the operation. The corporation, an LLC, whoever the tenant is going to be, okay? All right? Use. This premise will be used for the operation of a restaurant, but in reality, the one that we actually did had a description. This premise may use the operation of a poke bowl style business that, you know, that serves uh, beer and wine, so and so, you know, okay? All right? Put that there. Monthly rent. Okay, so in this case, this was a triple net lease, okay? Uh, when you ask them, well, normally retail is triple net. When you draw a lease for, uh, for uh, office, normally it's CAMS, okay? Common area maintenance, okay, services, okay? But in this case, it was a triple net. So this is how we did it. Okay, so like we said, term, five years with one five-year option with normal increases. Okay, so so I think that's where you're asking right there for the for uh, for uh, options. So normally, for leases, the common lease term is five years. Okay. Uh, if it's like a big anchor tenant, it's not uncommon at ten to twenty years with an anchor. Okay. But with normal leases, five years is is normal. Really, nothing less. Okay really very rarely less. Now, one of the things that uh, we always put in there is an option, okay? Well, option. You know, one of the, one of the options you can ask for, you can negotiate that, is we want an option to lease, okay? You know, at the current rent schedule. That means that when the option is, is executed, then it will just continue at the same rent with the increases, right? If you don't ask for that, then the other type of five-year option, option at market value. The seller, the landlord might insist option with market value. If it's an area, like for example, in a market that goes up and down, and, and, you know, or pretty stable, it might be okay, because but it's actually better 
to have an option at, at current rent schedule. The reason why is if you do option at market value, the market value of that location might have doubled. And then you'll have to pay double. Make sense? But you do want an option no matter what. Even if that's the only option they'll give you, you do want an option no matter what. Because if you're in an area that's extremely successful for you, even if you have to go up to market rent, at least you have the option to stay. If, if you're in an area that's extremely successful and, and you don't have an option, they could just evict you and put in your biggest competitor right in the spot. And the competitor will get a lot of goodwill from, from your location. Does that make sense? Okay. I've seen that happen before, plenty of times. So be careful on that, okay? And then when you sign that option for extra five years, at that time, you might negotiate even for another option after that, okay? All right, but that's, that's where we put our options. So sometimes I'll go in there five years with, with two five-year options. I might even ask for a, a, a five-year with two five-year options. But a lot of landlords, they might not give you two five-year options because they don't want to lock themselves in. What? Yes. No, no, no. Okay. It's, also, it's just an option. If you decide to, to quit your business, you want to move. At the end of the five years? No, not at, during the option five years. Do no. you still have to pay the life? Or yeah. You still have two years remaining. Okay, let's say you have two years remaining. On the option. Yeah. What do you mean on the option? That means you exercise the option? You are in the option. You finished your lease and you are in the option right now. Yeah, well, it's a five-year option. When you exercise your option, it just becomes a new five-year lease. So if you're three years into it, you have two years left, you still have to pay the remaining two years. Okay? I mean, by law, you have to pay the remaining two years. But you, can, you might buy yourself out. Or you might just default and they don't come after you. You know what I'm saying? You stop the rent and you decide not to take the option. So you don't have to pay, of course, the... Uh, no, you don't exercise the option. That's why it's called an option, you know? Okay? And you just leave. If you default, you can leave your business. I am this side. That's what I heard. What? Oh yeah, if you are in default, they can lock you out and lock all the equipment and use it as collateral. Okay? If you default, you can't just take your stuff. All they have to do is call the sheriff's department and they'll come and, and lock you out. Okay? Your equipment is used as liquidated damages, you know, whatever your rent is worth. Okay? You can't do that. All right, so in here, monthly rent, triple net. Okay, so in this case, uh, they asked for a three-month free rent. Sometimes the three months of free rent is included in the five years of 60 months, so you pay three months free rent, 57 months of rent, okay, if you ask for three months free rent, okay? Some people might call it a three month, uh, 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 basically a startup period, and then the 60 month starts in three months. So it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's a three month difference, okay? But, but some different landlords do it different ways. You just ask them how they do it. Um, in this case, all right, if it's three months, that's the free rent period, uh, zero per month for three months. Okay, they will have already collected first and last month though. The normal deposit that they collect up front is the first month that rent is due and the very last month. First, they call it first and last month. Okay, they'll calculate out what the last month of rent would be and they would collect that amount and that would be security deposit and including your first month's rent. So when they collect your first and last month's rent, you don't make a payment until, in this case, you don't make a payment until the month five. Because month one to three is free. Month four, they collect it up front when they sign the lease. So your payment, your first payment isn't due until the beginning of month five. Make sense? Okay, and you pay as you go. All right? 
Okay, in this case, you know, then we'd offer a certain amount of money per square feet plus triple net. Yes? What the 3% cost of uh, living is not included in there? It is, it has rent increases. You could put in there 3% CPI index, okay, but it, it, I put, you know, with normal increases. But when they, when they actually write up the contract, it'll be in there, okay? I just don't know what their increases their use are. I don't know exactly what their triple net is. Uh, but, but eventually before we sign, remember this is not even a contract. This is just the letter of intent. Once you start a communication, then you get all the details, okay? Uh, normally two and a half to three percent of the value of the lease. So let's say the lease comes out, let's say you're doing a 5,000 square foot lease at two bucks a foot, then that's a $10,000 base. $10,000 base, you know, normally they give you increases too, but, but if you look at the $10,000 base, over 60 months is $600,000. So it's basically 3% of the base for the entire period. So if it's 10,000 a month base times 60 months, then it's $600,000 in base, and you get 3,000, 3% of that, 18 grand. Yeah, no, it's a lot. Lease is very, I mean, lease is, you know, I mean, the work is pretty minimal, but the, the commissions is very high. Okay, 2.5%, 3% of base. Okay, you guys get that? Not of TIs, you know, you know, I mean, not of, not of, uh, not, not of a triple net or anything, it's the base. You know, so if the base is two bucks a foot, 6,000 square feet, or 5,000 square feet, that's 10,000 month base. Take that times 60, you get a percentage of that, okay? You get it? Yeah, yes. Uh, sometimes they'll say, sometimes they'll give you 3% of base first five years and half, one and a half percent of base following five years on a 10 year lease. So if, if it's like, if you take the same, you take the same deal, but your tenant signs for 10 years, they, they, they probably won't pay you 3% for the whole 10 years. Because there's so much to pay out. It's a risk for the landlord. Because what if your tenant goes in there and default after two months, you know? He got done paying you $40,000, $30,000. So they might pay you 3% uh, first five years and 1.5% next five years. So they'll pay you all up front, though, okay? Yeah, and you get it up front. You don't get it as you go. So the moment the lease is executed and they make their first down payment, then boom, you get a check for the whole amount. And you don't normally have to uh, have... You don't have to wait. Or about co-oping on a lease. So what do you mean? Like, as far as um, asking, you know, like on a purchase, you have to ask. The no, you still ask. You always ask. Okay, you still ask. All right? You still ask. Okay, commencement date, 90 days from delivery. So in this case, you don't really get your, well, you get your, you get your, um, your uh, commission when it's delivered. So you have to wait three months for this one, okay? Okay, delivery date, early occupancy. Upon lease execution, delivery of possession of the tenant, tenant shall be allowed to occupy uh, premises, complete its improvements and open for business upon delivery by landlord. Sometimes the delivery date is even faster. Sometimes the delivery date is next month and you get paid right away next month. Okay? Sometimes fast. All right, so the next thing is just delivery date. Okay? The next one is utilities. Okay. Tenants shall pay for all utilities and services supplied to the premises. If any such utilities or services are not separately metered or supplied, tenants shall pay its pro rata share to be determined by the landlord. However, tenants shall be responsible for all tap fees and impact fees imposed by any city or state municipality. Okay, let's talk about that for a second. All right. Tenants shall pay all utilities. So normally on a retail center, one of the questions that you'll ask is, is utility separately metered? Gas and electric, is it separately metered? Okay, uh, or is it one meter? Normally, when you're in a big office building, they don't have separate meters for each unit. That makes sense. And because of that, you just pay a 
common area charge for utilities. Okay? All right? In, an, in, an, in a retail center, there's triple net. And triple net are management fees, property taxes, uh, you know, uh, uh, insurance, those types of fees. And then so you pay your pro rata share of, your, of those fees. But electricity and gas, you pay it on your own. I mean, imagine you're, you're in a business that you're just selling clothes. And your neighbor is a restaurant that has all these ovens burning all the time. You want to pay for all their part of their gas bill? Does that make sense? Okay. So, or let's say next door to you is a laundromat. You want to pay their portion of electric bill? You see? So, so the thing is, is that normally in retail locations, every unit has a separate meter. So that's what it says. Uh, uh, you'll pay your utilities and services, but there's certain things that can't be separately metered, like water sometimes. Does that make sense? And those things, or then you just pay your pro rata share, just like your triple net. However, tenants shall be responsible for any kind of tap fees. Okay? Tap fees, like so, like, you know, if you have if you have any kind of special water need or any special disposal and sewer need, okay, then there's a special tap fee, okay? The thing is that in restaurants, you can't, you can't just throw all your leftover grease into the, into the sewer system. So then you have to build grease traps and then you collect all the grease that you use and then you have a company come and pipe all the grease out. Does it make sense? Okay. All right. Okay. Landlord's work, improvement allowance. Okay, let's talk about that. Landlord's work is this. Okay, what landlord's work means, and if, if you're in leasing, you're going to start understanding this, okay? And this is something that I'm, I'm giving you pre-advice uh, uh, pre, uh, now so you don't look like you're so brand spanking new, is... The delivery of the premises is a combination of what the landlord will do and what you need to do yourself. Normally on retail locations, they will give you a vanilla shell. Okay? A vanilla shell normally will have a ceiling. Okay? It will have walls that have been furred out. You know what a furred out wall is? Is, 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 is the wall is concrete. But then a fur out wall means that they put they put beams and now they're sheet rock. Make sense? So then furred out, okay? So so in leasing, normally they will provide a vanilla shell. Standard carpet, walls, walls have electrical outlets, there's a ceiling, you know, there's duct work, there's an HVAC. Okay? So the they will deliver in a vanilla shell. And then you will ask for, so landlord's work is provide vanilla shell, whatever. And so you will ask the other agent, how is the premises being delivered? They will go to you in a vanilla shell. Has a ceiling, has walls, has a floor, done. Then you say, well, we need an allowance. Sometimes they'll say, we'll give you a vanilla shell with two bathrooms, men and women. So, okay, that's fine. Or they will go, We'll give you a vanilla shell, two bathrooms, or whatever it costs for two bathrooms, and then we'll give you $10 a foot, okay, for TIs. TIs is tenant improvements. Because let's say, for example, you are leasing a space for a store. In retail, normally they're stores, okay? And your store needs to have some custom work, needs to have a counter, right, for a sales counter, it needs to have, you know, uh, maybe it needs a little bit of a bigger restrooms. Uh, maybe it, you know, it has, you know, uh, uh, you, know uh, uh, you need some rooms for storage. Does that make sense? Right? So if that's the case, then they'll say, we need some TI. Pretty common when something's delivered in a vanilla, they'll give you 5 to $15 in TI. 
but it's five or fifteen dollars per square feet. So if you're leasing five thousand square feet, let's say for a larger size restaurant, and they give you ten bucks a foot, they're giving you how much? Fifty thousand dollars. Okay? So they would uh, so you would get an engineer, you know, normally it's a space planner, an architect, they would draw up the space, contractors come and do the work, you would pay whatever it is, and you would have fifty thousand dollars from the landlord for credit. Does it make sense? How you get here? Huh? You ask for it. I know how you get this to they're not gonna give you fifty thousand from the very beginning. No, as you're doing the work and you they can see that you're doing the work, as the bills come in, then they'll they'll go ahead and 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 you could you could you could go expense from that account. But by the time you start doing that, you already signed the lease, you have a personal guarantee, there's a deposit, okay? All right, and then they give you the they start paying for it. Sometimes they will give it they'll give you fifty thousand dollars in free rent. That means fifty thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars a month that you you might not have to pay. You have three months free rent plus five months, so you might not have to pay till month nine or ten. Does that make sense? If you have the money from your pocket, so TIs can be negotiated in different ways. Okay, you guys got that? Oh yeah, I mean. Uh, okay. All right. So those are called tenant improvements, and it's it's what's ever negotiated. Yes. What's that? No, no, they go straight to the client. It doesn't go through us. We don't want it to go through us. Yeah, we don't want it to go through us. Okay, we don't want it to go through us. Huh? Who owns? No, the TIs belong to the building and they're fixtures. Yeah. <laughs> Who wants to own the wall? <laughs> you leave and take the wall with you? <laughs> no, no, TIs cannot be kitchen equipment. It has to be tenant improvements. It can't be for equipment, okay? It can be for new carpeting, new tile floor, whatever. All right? Okay? All right, we're almost done here. Almost done here, okay? Uh, tenants work, tenants shall complete all work necessary to build out, open tenants business. Signage. Okay, signage. Subject to city approval. I gotta go through here fast. I, I have someone who brought you guys a little bit of lunch today and I, I want them to talk to you the last few minutes. But man, when I have people come here and talk to you guys, don't just start getting up and leaving. It's rude, okay? It makes me look bad. If you have someone talking, then just sit and wait five minutes, okay? <laughs> All right? We know better than that. Yeah, one time I had someone come and just say a few words, and people just stand up. What are you doing? <laughs> they want to get out there first, so they can be first in line. They start packing up their things. Come on. You can wait, okay? All right. Okay, signage. Subject to city approval, landlord's reasonable approval. Tenants shall have a right to install protocol identification, including building signage, promotional, other signs. A lot of times you get to put a sign in front of your building, maybe on the, uh, on the monument, but you got to negotiate where that's going to be, okay? And what's allowed has to be by city standards. Can't be some crazy sign that's done cheap. There's, there's standard you have to go by, okay? Tenants shall provide landlord all planned uh, identification for approval fire prior to the lease. So normally you would provide that before they finish the lease. You don't want to do that after the lease. Why do they don't let you put the sign you want? Okay? So you get that negotiated prior to signing the lease. Okay? Common area. Tenant has non-exclusive rights to use all portions of the common area. Landlord may not permit any change or improvement concerning parking access, signage, or any other change that adversely affect the businesses. Like, like for example, if you have a retail spot and all of a sudden out of nowhere they reserve all the spots in front of you for your neighbor, then they can't do that. Does it make sense? Okay, tenant will pay share of taxes, insurance, common area maintenance, that's your triple net, based upon the ratio of tenant square footage, tenant share common area maintenance, non included capital expenditures. And this is important is that these fees, okay, cannot go up, okay, more than 5% any, any year from the immediate previous year, okay? 
payment of tax insurance, uh, 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 you know, shall commence upon the earlier of 180 days. Basically, what, what what it's saying is that you know, once we're in, you guys can't you can't just start improving all the buildings and start racking up all these expenses and giving it to us. Normally, when you're in a shopping center with everyone, when they improve the building, believe it or not, that cost gets passed on to you. They put a new roof. That cost of the new roof goes to the tenants, okay? Because the tenants are the ones that basically get the advantage of having a new roof, okay? If they put new paving, new driveway, new plants, anything they do to improve the building, the tenants, they sort of pay their fair share, okay? It's good for, your, it's good for the tenants, all right? Yes? Even that was stated in the contract after the lease. Huh? Sorry. Meaning that, you know, the tenant will really go in and see if, you know, like six months later, they oh, yeah. put $100,000 in the roof. Yeah. And they split it up. They split it up. And sometimes they have to amortize it out, okay? Over the, over, the, over the life of the roof. So you're paying for the depreciation of it. It's not like you pay for the whole thing all at once, okay? Yeah, yeah. Is there a formula for there parking are. spaces? Huh? Is there a formula for parking spaces? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, parking spaces for retail, the last of the parking spaces for office. You know, a parking spaces for medical. You know what I'm saying? I mean, shoot, a hospital has to have a lot of parking because people stay there for a month. You know? But how do you figure is it, like, um, per square feet, you get this amount of Yeah, per square feet. Okay. No, no, no. You don't get spaces reserved for you. They just have to have a certain number of spaces for the square footage of the whole entire complex. Okay, yeah. So for big time tenants, for example, like AT and D or like the government, will probably exclude the capital improvements as a past through. Yeah, it depends. Okay. Yeah, it depends. Okay. Sometimes they won't make you pay for it. Sometimes places do. Okay. Exclusive use so long as tenant is not in default of the lease is open to operate the premises. Landlord shall not lease space to another restaurant. Okay. Of the same type. So as long as you're in that shopping center, they're not going to lease it to another restaurant that does pokey. Does that make sense? All right. It's called exclusive use. First month's rent and security deposit. Tenant shall pay first month's rent, tax, and insurance, of, and, and, and security deposit equal to one month's rent on month 61 upon lease execution. So if we have first and last month's rent, lease shall be contingent on procurement of all licenses. So this basically says that the lease is contingent on us, them being able to get the permits to run their business, right? Be able to run their business, okay? Uh, total project cost. <coughs> and finally, last, last but not least, um, purchase rights, if, if they're big enough, if they're big enough, then you might work in there an option to buy, but if it's a big shopping center, we might not, they might not even do it. Okay, financial statement, tenant shall provide the landlord of financial statements. Broker, in this case, see, we get 3%. See, 3% the value of the lease. Okay, lease will be a net lease prepared by landlord. Okay, and of course, a proposal expires on a certain day, and then our disclaimer that this is not a deal until it's a deal. You guys got that? Yeah. All right, well, congratulations. Now you've seen what it looks like to do a LOI for both a sale and a list. Okay, well, don't, don't leave, don't leave. All right. <laughs> All right, providing lunch today is a group, is, is, it's for commercial here, okay guys? But it's also for residential. This is a group that does professional photos, okay? They do professional photos, professional marketing design, okay? Professional, you know, uh, uh, brochures, templates, okay? So they're a, they're basically a, 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 a marketing company that does professional photos and everything for your transactions, okay? And they wanted to come in and, 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 and talk to you about that. You know, you might want to reach out to them and get some of these brochures that they have because this will, when you're trying to get a listing, especially a commercial listing, you're going to need to put together this type of materials. I mean, when you're dealing with multi-million dollar properties, you know, out of your own pocket, you've got to be 
expecting to spend some money for expenses. Does that make sense? So I have Carrie from this company called Virtuance who does the uh, photos and stuff today here to talk to you about what they do and uh, the services they provide to you as residential agents and commercial agents. So please help me welcome up the, the talk, Carrie Hill. Give her a hand. Right, thank you. Come on up. And then and then try to stay right here because there's like another like 30 or 40 people online watching. Okay. So they can hear you right here, your camera right here. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sammy, can you put their website up please? Good morning, well afternoon now. Your food's on the way. There's some fresh veggies and fruit out there. I know you've been sitting for a long time, so I'm gonna keep this really quick. You know, our, my name's Carrie, I'm with Virtuance. We're a real estate photography and technology company. Here, stand were, right here, stand right oh, here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, because yeah. the camera's right here. Yeah, right, right there, yeah, you go right there. Yeah. Um, our company was founded in 2010 and our corporate offices are, offices are in Denver, Colorado. The reason the company was founded is Jeff Korn was a commercial real estate agent and he was frustrated with how much he was paying for his photography, for his commercial listings. So he did research for two years. He wanted to find out what makes a buyer click on an image because we know today that 96% of buyers or people who are looking for a lease option are looking online first. You only have six seconds to capture their attention and then you have 20 seconds before they decide if they're gonna go ahead and call you to make an appointment. So you don't have a whole lot of time, so the images are extremely important. And I'm just gonna show you some examples of the, the images that we provide, uh, because there's a lot of options all out there, and I'm sure a lot of you already have a photographer. I wanna show you a little bit about the differences our images make. And then if you go to features, and then scroll down, two, down, just a little bit, down, down, down. Okay, right there. So I'm going to show some examples of a professional image, which is on the left, versus the HD real image, so that you can see the difference. And unfortunately, um, it doesn't show really well up there. But okay, no, go back one. So go ahead and show the HD real. It's at the bottom right hand. <laughs> So this is an example of the HD real difference. So what we tell our clients is it's not just our technology, which HD real is a bracketing technique, which corrects for distortions. It's also our photographers. Let's go back to the first one again. Our photographers take our training because, I don't know at the bottom. Yeah, the competitor, see at the bottom? Oh, sorry. So you look at this photo, it's, and then you look at our photo, the HD real photo. It's about composition too. So we train our photographers in the art of composition so that they understand what features and angles are most appealing and effective when marketing real estate. So you can see a big difference. Let's look at the next one. Uh, it's the arrow in the middle. Okay, but okay, yes, perfect. So a lot of you have probably seen pictures where they forget to shut the toilet lid. At least they remember to shut the toilet lid in this one. But the closet door is open and you'll find that in commercial as well as residential. So let's look at the HD real image. Everyone knows that a bathroom has a toilet. So how important is it in the previous picture, that's kind of the focal point was the toilet. This one shows you what's most important, the grain in the cabinets, that big jacuzzi bathtub. So we understand what sells homes, and we that's what we purely focus on. What prompts a buyer to click on an image that they might otherwise have overlooked? Okay, let's go to the next one. This is a perfect example of what you do when you correct the, the lighting and again the angles. Go ahead and Lighting is everything. And I know that you've been in the, for those of you that have been in the industry, understand what you ask your sellers to do when you're getting ready to shoot their property or to do an open house. The lighting, things off the counter, everything that you go through them so that you're going to get the best possible showing of that property. Okay, let's look at the next one. 
This is a perfect example of the textures that are bracketing technique. Go ahead and look at the HD real image. You can actually see the texture and the smoothness of the stone and the different colors. That's a beautiful bathroom with a wonderful walk-in shower. So those are the things that you want the people that are looking, the buyers that are looking online to notice when they're looking for a property. This is one of my favorites because this goes along again with what's most important. This to me looks a little like a man cave. For most of you, I think we understand that men make decisions, but they're also highly influenced by the women in their lives. <laughs> and so this is a great looking man cave, but if you look at the HD real image, you still see the pool table, so they still get an idea. But what this photo does is it allows you to see that beautiful, beautiful um, out the window, the view that you have, and the ability a woman can see herself sitting in there in the chair looking out the window while her husband has all of his friends over playing pool. So anyway, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide you each with a 15% discount just for being here and listening. Um, and then we're going to do a drawing, so let's get a card from everybody, and each one will get a 15% discount off the next a new or existing listing. And so we're going to send some around, collect all your business cards, and do that drawing. The food should be here pretty soon. But if you have any questions, just let me know. And I have brochures for you. And these are... When you go on your commercial listing appointments, because I know it's not always, you're not always the only agent that they're looking at, the, not all, the only person that they're talking to. So this is a valuable tool that you can take on your listing appointments to show your clients. This is what I'm gonna do with your listing. You have a whole list of things that you're gonna provide for that client. But this is one more thing that you can offer that differentiates yourself from other people that they may be talking to, other agents. If you can show them, this is the photography that we're going to provide for you. This is the company and the science behind it. We did, we've did. we done studies with Toby Pro in 2018. Has anyone heard of Toby Pro? What it is, it's an eye tracking technology. And so we, what you do is you wear goggles. And through 2018, we showed a group of home buyers a list of images. And Virtuance was the image that was looked at, the Virtuance images was looked at longer and more frequently by potential buyers. So we're not a photography company that does headshots or weddings. All we do is real estate photography. So we're continuing to do the research, continuing to make improvements so that you are getting the benefits of that, so that when you're doing, taking photos of your listing, that's attracting the attention. If you sell your home faster, you end up getting more referrals. And we have additional tools under member resources. Once you register for an account, it's not up there right now, but when you register for an account, there's flyers you can print out, other listing tools, so, and that's all free to you. So did anybody have any questions? How yes. many photographers do you guys have local? We have a team of photographers, five or six currently. We just launched in this market in April. So we are brand new in this market. Um, we have 30 offices across the U.S., Chicago, from all the way back east to California. What's the average cost for a residential, or, or is it just commercial? Or? No, we, we do both. Good question. Our residential photography ranges anywhere from 119 and up. For one, our most common package is 179 and you're going to get the 15% off that, so it would be 150 That gives you 25 images, two virtual tours, one virtual <coughs> tour that's branded with all your information, your picture, and ready to upload to all your personal marketing pages. You're also going to get a virtual tour that's already ready to go for the MLS. The photos are sized and ordered for you, so it's ready to go. One of the most important things that I didn't even touch on is we're going to provide you with a stats report. And what that gives you is it shows you which images that they're clicking on most frequently. It also shows you the traffic you're getting the website, the websites you're getting the traffic from. So that's provided to you for each of your listings on a weekly basis. A lot of our top brokers print that out and take it on their next listing appointment. So just another service added value that you're talking to your sellers about.
We currently do not have anyone in the Bay Area. We have Southern California, San Diego area. Uh, once we really get the Sacramento territory launched, we will be moving that direction. So, good question. So, so you said 150 for 25 inches? It's 179 for 25 inches. You're going to get the 15% discount today. And that's commercial or residential? Uh, the commercial is priced a little bit differently. Can you, can you look at the bot? Top left hand, see where it says looking for commercial site. Right. Yeah. And then if you slide down right there, square in the orange. Yes. Yes. Okay, <coughs> does anyone have a zip code that they currently have a commercial pro project in? Something local? You can pick any one, you can pick the zip code for here. And, and then show pricing. So the commercial photography packages are a little different than the residential. And then just click OK. Is there a commercial option? I think Malt. it's Malt. Industrial. And it would be well you can look at industrial or the other. So the prices range exterior, interior, exterior, and interior. You can get the fit, you can use that on your 15%. So it's for residential, it's interior and exterior, it's a package for 176. Correct, correct. And you get that five the cards, the You're gonna pass out those right? Yes, yes. So when, you get that, uh, when you when you just sign up with this, I mean you think you read a good question. Is extra? That's what I'm trying to no, this is free. Any oh. of our marketing materials are free. So if you run out and you need additional marketing materials, I'm going to pass my business card around. Just give me a call and I can provide you with additional marketing materials. Also, we once you register, it's free to register. There's also checklists that you can provide to your clients as far as what you want them to do to get their properties ready. There's flyers. A, a lot of different materials that are free to use. So please, everyone, register. It's it's there for you. It's free resources. Uh, so, we'll just around time. I, once you call in, you can either call in Monday through Friday, nine to five, or go on our website, twenty four seven. We're one to three business days. So when you call to place your order, once we are outside of that three business days, we're constantly having photographers that we're training and putting in markets. So that's the the longest is the three days. The turnaround time. Line. Oh, turnaround time next day by 5 p.m. So once the photographers out there, Nick, if you shoot on Friday noon on Saturday, we currently don't have photographers that are working on the weekend, but we do do the shoots on Friday and deliver the images by Saturday at noon. And I'm going to give everybody a business card and these materials. And I have a form if you would please fill out for me. I'm going to pass this around. And there's boxes at the bottom. If I have your business card, all I really need is your first and last name because your email and everything else is on your business card. And just check whatever boxes apply to what your current situation is. The one nice thing that I've heard from a lot of uh, a lot of the clients is your time is very valuable. I'm sure. Your brokers tell you all the time that you need to invest your time in things that are making you money, that are building your business. And so what the, one of the important things that we do is once our photos are taken and sent through the HD Real technology, then we have someone look at each photo and make any adjustments that needs to be made. After that is done, then the photos are put in order for you. So once you get your package, it's ready to go. You don't have to do anything else. 
If there's a photo that you're not happy with, we can do some adjustments. Say they forgot and left a trash can out or a car parked in the garage. We can do that. We do have a, we have 13 enhancements. So they're online. Can I add something? Yes, please. Hey guys, when we're doing these types of photos, especially for the buildings, like if we ever do commercial, you need to have something like this. You can't, you can't do things that are not like top quality. And then when you, and then if you have high end listings or nice listings, you, you need to do this. But, the, but here's the cool thing, is you save some of this marketing material and then you bring it on your listing appointments. And you say, hey, this is what the competitor does and these are the type of things that we do for your home. And it, it goes a long way, you know what I'm saying? It goes a long way. You might spend an extra hundred, two hundred dollars, but man, you end up winning the deal that makes you fifteen, twenty thousand dollars for commissions. You know, ultimately, that's what you want. Is you want to be able to win the deal. Does it make sense? Okay. So that's exactly what you guys want. I was going to show you the what a difference the twilight makes. You know, and some, especially this is a twilight. Our twilight is not photoshopped. So. I'm adding to what he said, if you have a property that has a backyard like this, twilight makes all the difference in the world. The sky, they can see themselves in that swimming pool watching the sunset. I mean, a buyer looks at that photo, that's a photo that's going to get clicked on more often than not. Yes, that is the actual picture. That we do, our twilight is a little more expensive and the reason why is the photographer is there at twilight. So we can only book one of those a day. But when you have a listing, you know, we always talk about what price point should you do professional photography. And I have a great story for that, real quick. I know we're probably out of time. I met with, I was at an appointment with Christina um, when she's your county appraiser and she came into a real estate office and did a presentation about how they're appraising properties afterwards I said you know would you come to some of my meetings and do this presentation I'm a real estate photography company she said my mom's in Denver and she's selling her home um, and she listed her house she found the perfect house she wanted online shopping like most people do she found the perfect house then she hired a listing agent to sell her house she got the photos back and she was horrified, horrified. She asked her agent, why do my photos look like this and the house I'm buying, which they were downsizing, which is super important, why are those photos so much better than my $500,000 home and I'm buying a $300,000 home? That's a tough conversation to have with your client. And so what she did is when the listing expired, she hired another agent, she had the photos read, the new agent had the photos read done, the house was sold in three days, had an offer in three days. Photos make a huge difference. It's not the place to cut corners at all. Okay. Will you pass, can I pick up all those forms? All right, great. And then I think your lunch is on the way. I'm not quite here yet. But there's fruits and uh, veggies over there to the drinks. And I believe something is on its way here soon. <laughs> actually, actually, it's pizza. There's a couple of veggies and a couple of pieces. I went to pick up your food. We have a stand in our company, AOI, and not I guess, yeah, or okay. The food wasn't ready, so. Okay. Alright, thank you guys. Hey, uh, class, I will see you next Tuesday, okay? We're going to be going over the due diligence and the actual purchase and lease agreements next week, okay? So do not, do not miss next week's class. I'll see you next week.